everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Brian Beeler. We've been doing a lot of work with Eaton, as, as many of you know that follow us. You can see the, uh, the 9PX lithium ion that we just reviewed and did a uh, walkthrough video on on the table, the very popular Eaton frogs that we uh, give away to our contest winners in, a, in addition to whatever the prizes are. Uh, but we've been getting some great feedback from you guys in the community. Uh, we got uh, a couple key questions based on uh, some of the recent postings we did around the 9PX lithium ion on our social media and on uh, the video on YouTube. And, and two things bubbled up. One was what Eaton does more than uh, transmissions. And yes, they, they do in fact do transmissions, but the IT world knows them for other things. And two, can we get more content from you guys around power and power management and all that sort of thing? So we're going to do both. We're going to we're going to get more information about Eaton and their products and uh, dive deeper into some of the, the core concepts that uh, that they've been working on, that we've been working on in the storage view lab and, and all sorts of uh, other goodies. So uh, I welcome in uh, David Windsor. David's uh, been with Eaton for about 17 years down in North Carolina. He should know everything about what's going on down there. David, thanks for coming in today. Uh, thanks, Brian. Good to be here. Yeah, appreciate it. I mean, we've been with Eaton for, gosh, at least coming up on a decade now. You guys provided our very first rack at Storage Review. Yep. You provided our first UPS, uh, power conditioning, PDUs. I mean, whatever you've got, yeah. we, we, we've been taken from you <laughs> for a yeah. long time. G glad, glad to give it away to you guys. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think we launched the 5PX in 2011, so uh, yep. right around 10 years, yeah. We're still running uh, uh, at least one of those, if not two, and, and made one battery change, and or maybe two by now. But uh, uh, I mean, the stuff is rock hard, and and you know we're in a uh, suburban office setting outside of Eastern Cincinnati, and mm -hmm. it's not often that we run into power problems, but we do see it a couple times a year where we'll have events. In fact, uh, I guess it's been about four years ago now. They were working out on the the road. Uh, near our office and a dump truck went cruising by with his bed up and jacked all the overhead power lines and we were down for a number of hours and while you guys are very kind you're not kind enough to keep us up for uh, seven or eight hours but the key key learning is we were able to keep our core machines up power down gracefully and and recover or, or execute our dr plan which is go home early um so that that's what we did, but we've been using this stuff forever, and it's been just fantastic. E Eaton, we Eaton, you can probably Google it and find it. We used to have a uh, like a, a blackout tracker, and we we collect mm -hmm. all the stories from across the country and use it in our marketing, and kind of create a database of like these active failures and why they happened. And uh, we've had everything. You know, ma main cause is usually squirrels. Um, it's not a power event, but uh, I have not heard the dump truck running into the power lines excuse yet. That was that's fantastic. Yeah, um, we actually did a. Um, I think it was at a VM World. We did a little uh, a mini session uh, with with one of your guys on some turbo session on on what had happened and how bad stuff happens. And you can plan all you want, and sometimes there's just nothing you can do. Gosh, yeah, no, that there's no there's no solution for that. There's no. <laughs> No, not really. Uh, but re reset, reset for us, for people that aren't super familiar with Eaton, about what it is you guys do. Because I think people go to Eaton.com and they're like, oh my goodness, they make golf yeah. grips and transmissions and hydraulics and, and yeah. lubricant fluid, like all thousands of products. You know, yeah. how do you, What do you do there specifically that's relevant yeah. to the data center? Yeah, shout out to Golf Pride. Um, you know, little know that Eaton has a uh, golf Friday is one of Eaton's um, brands, but uh, that we work with. But our, our business broke up into probably two big categories, uh, industrial and, and electrical. And uh, within electrical, you have, um, you know, panel boards, switch boards, breakers, uh, transformers, things like that. But, uh, you know, our business is uh, data center infrastructure, which is, um, you know, battery backups, um racks, rack PDUs, uh, power distribution equipment, um, how to power your data center and, and, and hold your infrastructure together on the IT level. And so that's where that's where I specialize and that's where Eaton's been for um, right about as long as I have, about 17 years. Okay. So, I mean, of course, that's how we know you. We use the racks. We use all of the stuff that you just mentioned that I led in with. 
And, um, you know, it's really interesting to me in terms of how the company has progressed, because I think we think about power conditioning and batteries as not entirely super innovative. Maybe it gets sort of cast <laughs> in, in, the, in the bucket of necessary yeah. stuff, but stuff that yeah. doesn't change a whole lot. Um, but for your part, and we'll talk about all of this, but we've got lithium ion sitting on the desk that's increasing in capacity and capability. That's really cool. We've got the uh, networking cards that we've been onto from the jump that are uh, uh, that are super neat in terms of uh, what they can do and the reporting they show and the visibility into these systems. But there's also uh, a lot of good stuff. You've got integrations with VMware uh, in terms of understanding yeah. what a virtualized environment is and how to handle failures and, and that sort of thing. So let's break down some of these topics and, and just you know, see what's going on, what's the latest. You know, lithium ion obviously is, is on our brain. I've got this uh, 2U9PX sitting in front of me that's yep. um, uh, been a great little unit and little actually because you, the, the lithium ion units are physically smaller than lead acid. But at a high level, what are you guys seeing with lithium ion? Why are you excited there? Yeah, it, I think everyone who is in IT, um, who's a sysadmin or, or is responsible for their infrastructure, has had to have gone through the pain of replacing batteries. And it's a task that adds probably zero to, to little value. Uh, and the, the opportunity really to have the battery life match the product life cycle. So the, when, when the battery's done, the product is done. Um, I think is people are really excited about that. They are ready to move on. And you know, Eaton's dream is to let people get back to their daily job and not worry about their infrastructure. And I think this, this product enables them to do that. So really, really excited about that. Um, they are at higher price points. Um, the lithium technology is is still, you know, it's it's you know very. We're all very aware of it and what's going on with the the electric vehicle market. But um, I think the the price points will come down. But right now, you know, it's for many customers, it's attractive, and for customers especially that are operating at scale, uh, might have might have remote sites and want to go hands free um, and see the value and not rolling a truck. This is this is for them, and we're seeing people act on it. It's 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 great. Well, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that that more enterprise infrastructure is being pushed to the edge, whether it's retail, whether it's some sort of analytics at the edge, data collection, any sorts of, of those uh, very popular notions. And having a unit that doesn't require the service that uh, that, that perhaps a lead acid alternative does is is attractive. Um that's is that what you're seeing is the big selling point the the increased warranty and the gap between having to replace batteries i think the increased warranty goes with i don't know that customers are necessarily have ever communicated that directly to us but i think it's okay. kind of like hey is this thing really going to last 10 years and what are you doing to back it up that seems to be mm. some of the feedback we've had of why we've initiated that um we had a product uh the, the 5p 1500 uh, R-L, that's been a lithium ion product uh, that we've had out since I believe 2016. And that was really well received. And you know, we've learned a lot from that. We've taken those learnings into this product. But uh, I think that customers just looking for, hey, how do, how do I manage all my IT systems and, and really just go hands free and like set it and forget it is probably the, the one thing I'd summarize what I, what I hear is I really want to set this and forget this and never worry about it again. Um, yeah. So what's the future for lithium ion? What, or what's the Eaton challenge? More density, bigger units, drive price down? Like where, where are you f focusing your energy? I think you know, when you look at lithium, yes, it's more dense. And uh, that's great. But there's some technology kind of hurdles to overcome. Uh, the biggest one is eat the cell, a lithium cell um, carries less current than a lead acid one. And so... Right. Well, that means nothing to a to a user. For Eaton, that means we had kind of a paradox running. We want to provide customers with really dense, uh, full power units, um, and we, we want to provide those with the right runtime. A lot of our customers just want minimal runtime. They want to, you know, last through a generator. Uh, they don't want to overspend. Uh, but the the way that lithium runs is because it has a lower current capability. We we inherently have to provide more batteries. To match the current, um, so what you see is the minimum number of batteries we could get with this this 9px that you're looking at um, gives you twice the runtime. Uh, 
<laughs> so you kind of have this thing where you're like, hey, look, this has more runtime. That's great. But that's not because we, we necessarily were trying to meet a runtime target. We're trying to make sure that we're delivering that lithium ion technology in a safe manner. And 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 uh, it's kind of it's kind of a trade off. So I think when you look at where's lithium ion going, they're going to be you know manufacturing improvements into the cells where you know we're talking to our suppliers and, and on the lookout for the second you know a new cell comes out that's um, more current capacity. You're going to see you know probably the runtime drop to your normal expected levels, probably three to five minutes. And I would hope that. Um, you know, as that happens, the price is going to come down for the user. Um, so, so I, you know, those are those are you know metrics that help us. You know, expect adoption is going to be much higher than it is now. We think that you know, hey, maybe you know, twenty percent of the market might flip to mark uh, lithium. I don't know if that's aggressive or, or uh, not aggressive enough. But um, you know, you, one thing's for sure: you lower the price of entry to for a customer, and you're like, hey. I want lithium. I don't want to touch these batteries. More people are going to take it up and adopt it. So you're talking, yeah, that's interesting. But you're talking about a couple use cases. I want to dive into a little further. So we started a little bit, and I was talking about edge, and that's that's one um, sort of uh, trajectory. Then in the larger scale data center, maybe in the core, you're talking about holding up for just a few minutes while your backup systems take over. Yeah. Uh, where are you seeing the edge deploy? Uh, either you know, some sort of generator, natural gas, or, or fuel-based generators at those locations also? Or, or you know, what are you seeing as you get further away from the data center specifically? Yeah, I mean, so we, we envisioned the product like a 9px to be anything from a, a, a you know, your, your very small computer room to something on the edge that's just backing up a switch, right? And everything in between. So, you know, for the 9px, we don't think that's necessarily one application-specific product. Um, and so, you know, we, we have a mix of customers that don't have generators or people that are, you know, running a full generator setup. Um, probably at that size, something about probably natural gas or, or um, you know, may, maybe, maybe something else like propane. But, um, you know, it's, it's a smaller setup. Uh, maybe it's tied into a, a bigger campus type setting where there are diesel generators. Um, but, you know, we, it shouldn't be a problem for the 9px. I mean, the 9px is, you know, it's double conversion top topology. It's cleaning the sine wave uh, on the rectifier, converting that to DC, providing it to a, an AC inverter output. You know, that's the technology that you want when you're doing things and you're worried about mission critical power. And uh, the 9px delivers, you know, both lithium ion and that that tried and true technology in, in one box. Okay. Uh, well, that's uh, that's yeah. cool. It's good perspective. Yeah. I think. I think I, if, yeah. To add to that, I think one thing, you know, you, you kind of to add to the conversation that you and I probably wouldn't have gotten to otherwise is on the large side, like when you walk into a data center, mm -hmm. I, I think about 50 percent of the market right now on large data center UPSs is switching over to lithium. And really the, fa the thing holding it back, I think, from maybe going faster is just supply. Like, you know, if we can get more lithium, we could probably sell more lithium. So. There's some interesting supply chain in the middle of the pandemic that uh, those realities are, are 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 helping our customers uh, either accelerate or or kind of work how to get to lithium. Um, people are excited about not changing batteries, and they're excited about the cycle life, uh, the lifetime, hands-free. It's where it's at. So what do you? Okay, so that's a couple scales, and you started talking about big data centers too. At the hyperscale. Do yeah. you see anything different happening there? And if so, is there anything that more mainstream orgs can draw from what they're doing at hyperscale? I, I just like to look at what goes on there, like the, the contributions back to OCP around storage and compute and infrastructure are really interesting. I don't know that I see so much about power there. and Maybe I'm just not looking, but I'm a little curious to, to see if you have any insight there. Yeah, at OCP, they're, they're looking at Maybe maybe there's an initiative to make companies like uh, Eaton and our competitors maybe a little irrelevant. You know, I think they're trying to put, uh, which 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 is understandable. Um, we, we're, they're trying to get cost out and work at scale. So uh, they're trying to put, okay, here's here's my. They have a power shelf. Um, how do I transition and and have uh, you know a power shelf that has DC power and I got batteries that are can be swapped in and out. 
uh, pretty easily. Um, really, I think to, to me, that's hey, how do I how do I operate at scale and how do I simplify everything to a cookie cutter installation? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's where you see a lot of the hyperscalers either going or experimenting with. Um, that's not the first time I've seen you know, the hyperscalers in my 17 years try to do that. And I don't know that, um, you know, how, how successful and is how that scales, um, is something we pay attention to and care a lot about. I don't know that it's, um, the end of the world for us. Uh, what I will say is, you know, how does it, you asked the question, Brian, how does that translate to, um, other customers? Uh, I think the, what we see customers trying to take that mentality is how do you repeat, how do you be repeatable, right? How do you, how do you do something and operate at scale and make one installation or location look exactly the same? And so, you know, when you get above five UPSs and they're no longer in the same room and they're all scattered around, how can you know exactly at all times what this closet looks like versus that? And sometimes there's a, hey, maybe I should pay a little bit more for, or maybe maybe just simplify my installation. Maybe cost isn't the, the driver, but I simplify my installation to, I don't try to guess at what this installation should look like or that installation to kind of have cost be the primary factor. But um, if they're standardized, that probably saves me time in the long run versus maybe saving a hundred dollars or two or two hundred dollars. So that would be the the lesson I, I I take away from what the hyperscalers are playing with. Yeah, well, I mean, the hyperscalers obviously have the resiliency advantage that even the most aggressive enterprises yeah. <laughs> you know, can't lose several sites and still be operational. It's just not not reality. Right. Uh, so the rules are different, but with different rules comes different innovation. And so it's always interesting to see what those guys are up to and and how that that might yeah. change. I think I think the, the big one, the big one that I, I, I think is interesting and who knows where it goes is there's there's a big push you know, that you're starting to see from that kind of side of the world on DC power, right? And so how that, how that, how that turns out and how that applies to uh, day-to-day of enterprise, you know, to be determined, but it's a game where we're, we're, you know, we're we're engaged in and uh, it's kind of exciting to see where it goes if DC power offers, you know, reliability alternatives uh, that are, that are better and, um, you know, uh, efficiency savings, um, maybe, maybe cost savings. So we'll see. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's a useful insight. You started to also talk about managing distributed architecture or infrastructure. And I think that's something that's interesting that I wanted to get to, too. Uh, before we get there, the TikTok video we did of Kevin putting in the network card in the back of this UPX, uh, or UPS uh, nine nine PX got something like I don't know fifteen thousand views, which is which is crazy. It tells me that people um, <laughs> have quite an interest and hunger in things that I had no idea people had <laughs> hunger for. It's amazing. Uh, but the network card, it's such a little thing. It's a couple hundred bucks. It's not terribly expensive. Um, but the visualization you get into your infrastructure, into your power management, the control you get is really cool. What We've got all of that in another YouTube video if people want to check out the visuals and what that looks like. We'll link to it in the, the description of, of this show. Um, but talk about why that card's important and why Eaton continues to innovate there. This is the Gen 2 card that we're using. Yeah. I mean, any, I think if you're trying to do and your, your job as an IT manager and you have more than one UPS and you have more than one, you know, computer room, network closet, you know, infrastructure um, that is right next, not, that is not right next to your desk, desk. How, do, how do you, how do you start to manage that? Right. And, um, you know, when, when power goes out, um, you know, you, you guys are with storage review. What's, what's the cost of doing a, uh, uh, a disc recovery or, um, you know, memory recovery when, when power goes out at the wrong time, when you're reading and writing uh, mm-hmm. a heck of a lot of information at once, you know, that graceful shutdown that you can, that you can do, you can do over USB, but as you, as you move up into scale, it gets a lot easier, especially when you're running something like VMware or another, um, you know, uh, yeah, you know, I guess hypervisor platform, sure. like, like, like that's, that's really powerful stuff to, to be able to do that and, and make it happen, uh, in an automated way. You no longer have to micromanage it. You, you set up the policies ahead of time. 
um, through through our, our our IPM or our IPP uh, graceful shutdown manager, and you, you're kind of you're you're kind of set. You can you can go to sleep at night and wake up and, and know that all the correct actions happen. Um, pretty and, and and you you save your data and you save yourself the recovery time. That's a that's a big headache. And so so that's one aspect is is you know that that functionality is much better with a network card than it can ever be with USB. And then you go to uh, you know, what happens when I have multiple units and I'm trying to operate at scale? I mean, do I really want five emails every time I have my five UPSs go to battery? Uh, nope. And uh, what happens when I have 20 or 50 or et cetera? Um, the network management card just becomes invaluable. And, and most customers, I think, that have that many have started to see that. Um, but, you know, automating and tying into your daily dashboards of how do I budget? Um, how, do I, how do I make sure I know how I'm scaling? Those are those are the things the network card enables you to do, and um, and increasingly this the software makes it even easier. So, yeah, and there's additional visibility too, right? With additional uh, sensors that you can add to these systems. Even this little two you guy, I mean, you can patch in additional sensors to get data on on yeah. environmental, and thermals, stuff like that. That's that that's important um, information, and then you start to coalesce that data in one spot, which is even better. I mean, yeah, take the, you can turn that into a door contact sensor, um, water leak, fire alarm, uh, anything that takes a normally open closed contact. And you can kind of create your own rack that is like as soon as something happens in that rack, if there's a vibration sensor, that, that alarm will go off. Uh, the, the UPS web card or rack PDU web card can, can notify you. And all of a sudden, you know exactly what's going on. And you, you're, you're in control of your infrastructure and you kind of have this micromanaged security um it's good it's it's good it's it's awesome to have at your fingertips yeah well you you talked about what do you do when, when you lose power uh in an unexpected way right and it's it's it seems to be getting worse and i tell this story and i probably should not but kevin's <laughs> favorite way to we we shut down gear and bring it up a lot because we're open air cooled and our third big maybe fourth biggest expense is electricity even in our little office um, so when we're not actively testing an array or a server or whatever we'll, we'll turn it down because if it doesn't need to be on then we, we don't want to we don't want to create the heat especially in august in ohio uh, and we don't want to pay to even have it you know idle or even plugged in and, and sipping so what kevin's favorite way to power down any device is to go behind it and pull the power cords and he got into a nasty habit of doing that with storage arrays, and they don't care for that behavior. No. When they come back up, no. uh, sometimes they would be okay, and sometimes they would be super pissed and take 45 minutes running parity checks and data integrity checks. And meanwhile, the volumes and shares are, are probably available, but is certainly working in a de degraded or suboptimal state. For us, again, we didn't care because we weren't using it in production. But the, the serious point being is whether you jerk the plugs out of the back of the system or you have a, a power uh, loss event that's unexpected that, that hits your array directly, the, re the rebuild or getting online uh, in a high quality state quickly is, is a serious issue. It's, it's, an, it's insane. And so when we have, you know, I think one of the things I spent... <clears throat> A good time of doing in the last, you know, 11, 10, 10, 11 years is trying to come up with, you know, uh, uh, schemes or recommendations, uh, architecture solutions. So where um, customers that are that are backing up equipment that have that kind of adverse effect to a power event you know, are not solely dependent on the quality or the reliability of the UPS. Like Eaton makes rock solid hardware. You kind of gave us a plug for that. I think we do as well. But you know, if you look at the power chain from the utility all the way down to your your IT device, you know that UPS is. You know, we design it to be self-sacrificing. When something really bad happens, we want our device to fail before we want yours to fail, right? So whether that's from a lightning event or just multiple hits over time, um, your device is designed to kind of take itself offline and make sure, um, hey, all the surges, the power events didn't get through. You, you put that together with like, um, you know, we have we have dual corded devices on lots of IT equipment now. 
Yeah. Do we know how to use them? <laughs> Are we know? Do we know what that's for? Right. And so, I think that's <laughs> that's probably the one thing I when you say that I think to your audience is, hey, be thinking about that. That may that may mean two UPSs. That may mean the other ones connected to a, a you know, a, a really robust surge protector of some sort. Um, uh, maybe if there's an ATS involved somewhere in the an automatic transfer switch involved somewhere. So be really thinking about yeah, if my device is really that mission critical, am I really dependent on one stock gap and, and putting my, my all my eggs in one basket for that one product or that one, one piece instead of building a, a level of kind of redundancy to, to make sure I'm building the architecture I need for my, my business. No, it's a good point. Back in the the early website days of that I was operating before Storage Review, even we ran on uh, some a couple early Dell PowerEdge servers, and we kept buying them. We bought with two power supplies because we want redundancy, right? So we're ahead of the game. And then we made the wise investment decision of buying Y cables so that we could consolidate down to a single plug to <laughs> to not have to have uh, so many PDU ports filled <laughs> up in our rack. But I think we were doing that back in the old Colo days because they were charging you for every single thing that you took right. out of that thing, whether it was a U or a sip of power or a power uh, a plug. I mean, I think we were getting hit on all that stuff. So. Yeah, that probably wasn't best for redundancy, but in a colo, we figured we were probably okay. But yeah. now, yeah, I mean, if you were even at the, you know, if you've got a little HCI cluster out at the edge, you probably could put or or possibly should put two and 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 run them separate and and be a little more aggressive in your in your plan if you can budget for it. Um, yeah, that's not the worst idea. Yep. So we were. T- we were talking about uh, software, what you've got on the networking card, but you guys have some other packages too. And to be honest, you know, we haven't really explored those yet, but maybe something we should look into. Tell us about some of the other software that you have going on or some of the other integrations you have that are important to uh, Eaton in, in terms of enabling your customers to visualize and manage these uh, larger environments. Yeah, so you, you gave a shout out to two things earlier. Um, one was kind of virtualization. So we that's a story, hopefully, your audience has heard before, uh, hopefully from Eaton. If not, uh, it's, it seems to be fairly well understood in the industry. Uh, from my perspective, is it's like, hey, we can shut down hypervisors and we can shut down, you know, specific virtual machines. Um, so, so you, you shut down the non-critical ones. Uh, you let the critical ones continue to run, uh, consume less on battery, and then um, if everything's not okay, still. Um, after a certain period of time, then you gracefully shut down everything. Um, and then when power comes back, everything automatically restarts uh, in reverse order. Um, so that that's that functionality is there. Uh, but Eaton also has, you talked about H- HCI. I mean, Eaton's doing that. Uh, great, best example is probably Nutanix. Um, we can gracefully you know, coordinate a, a virtual machine move on a Nutanix platform you know, to your, to your data recovery site. Um, you could gracefully shut down. I don't know how many people want to do that, but um, initiate a, a virtual machine move and a, that via migration right. something as well. So um, those are those are a couple of key points I would pay attention to in our uh, those are IPM offerings um, in our IP, IPM um, management suite. Um, other things that customers might want to know, you know, if you're operating at scale, uh, if you're in an enterprise site, you know, Eaton's gotten to the DSEM game. So that's a probably a four letter word for many customers, but Eaton has a really great uh, platform uh, and, and what we call um, Visual Power Manager, VPM, uh, that allows you to really operate, you know, rack PDUs, UPSs, any other kind of power device along those lines, um, and, and kind of get them into one dashboard. Um, and we have a, a plot that, that actually is a scalable platform that jumps into something we call a VCOM um, which which kind of looks like a traditional DSIM where you can pull in your gen sets and your transfer switches and your maybe your HVAC and look at that infrastructure piece from one view uh, and really lay out your data center and maybe then get into some actual the IT asset management if you want to do that too. So um, Eaton's, Eaton's t- taking a, a big step forward in that. Uh, the other one that we keep uh, seeing a lot of traction on, to be honest, is um, uh, Predict Pulse, which is our mm-hmm. cloud platform. Uh, so, you know, if you're looking for clouds, of clouds, a four letter word is, or five letter word now, but, um, you know, 
cloud, I'd really say that, hey, if you want to remote monitoring, if you don't want to stand up and knock, and you have a lot of UPSs that you need somebody watching over them, rolling a truck uh, tied to Eaton service when there's something wrong, um, Eaton, Eaton does that and has that service. And we do it for large data centers all the way down through to K through 12s are using the service, uh, hospitals, uh, colleges and universities. So I think it, when you're operating at scale, uh, we have solutions for, for all kinds of users, whether you're looking for something on premise and looking to host it, or you're looking for somebody to outsource the monitoring, uh, Eaton can do that. Uh, you'll you'll increasingly see all of this, you know, coined by the term bright layer. Uh, that's going to be our our new kind of okay. portfolio name moving forward. But um, that's that's kind of uh, the future of the product line. But uh, it's all it's all coming together, and it's but it's exciting where we are now. You you mentioned PDUs a couple times. Uh, we use those uh, in all of our racks, of course. Uh, Jeff Kennedy, uh, no no one more excited on the planet about PDUs than that guy. I no. remember him him trying to pitch me on the the idea of, of green and blue and pink and purple PDUs, and I thought he yeah. was insane. And yeah. then he's like, then he's like, yeah, but it makes perfect sense, man. You do a green one on the left and a blue one on the right, and then everyone knows where things go and it's color coordinated. And I said, ah, okay, maybe you're not so crazy. Um, what what's going on in the PDU space? Is there anything? Uh, innovative there i mean i don't know how to yeah how, how to get real excited about pdus they've kind of done their job for the last couple of years right yeah we we love we love ups's but the rack pdu market i feel like it's more is happening there than on the UPS. really okay but, well, yeah tell us um, about it i'm curious yeah. first first thing would be we're first thing would be uh, c39 outlets so okay. we're probably familiar with c13s and c19 so c13 c14 connection 19 20 um those are those are kind of two two main outlets you have and a big problem that customers have especially when you're on the enterprise side or even at a colo is which ones do i buy and that creates customization um, non-standard part numbers that means you're paying more than you should um, and it makes makes you maybe not future proof and uh c39 39 outlet is an outlet kind of like a 520 on the nema side uh, that takes both uh, and oh. so it's an outlet that gives you the ability to put either cord in there. Uh, it's protectively, uh, protected, properly protected by NEC uh, for NEC code. And you're off and running, and you get one unit that kind of does everything and future proofs your rack PDU. I think that's fantastic. That means net for the customer, you're going to get uh, easier to find rack PDUs that are off the shelf, that are ready to ship whenever you want. That's where I see this is going. And uh, we're launching those uh, here in September on our HD platform. Okay. Um, so, you know, higher higher capacity, higher density solutions, but um, you're gonna see those rolled out um, probably in the next year uh, across standard platforms where you're looking at, hey, I get 42 outlets and 42 U. Um, that's spectacular on a 30 amp rack PDU, 17 KW, I want that. and how do I know which mix I want between C13s? Yeah, and C13? now you don't have to care. C39 solves it for you, and again, wow. now you're buying something off the shelf, and that takes probably takes your cost down maybe 20, as much as 20. percent So I think those are just big. It's a big story, and uh, we'll be seeing yeah. the impact of it shortly. Yeah. So that's well, one, and I think, well, I think but, the, yeah, but for us though, that's really cool because we get gear in every couple of days, and no one ever asks us. <laughs> what we want on the back side of that for power That's right. it, it just shows yeah. up we get we get you know every connector possible and then you know got a crisscross applesauce them on the back of the the racks to match them up with the uh, the right outlet types right, right. The, right. Other, the, other, the other exciting thing that's going on is we're trying to move our portfolio we, we see people that we were uh, working with them on custom applications but we really wanted to get away from the custom application side. And if you're doing something that's you know a super compute type project and you're going to very, very dense solutions, we're gonna be moving our rack PDU from you know 30 amps around 17 kW to to 40, uh, you know, probably 60 amps, uh, 45 kW. So a lot of power in a really small space. And um, we think that's you know gonna be really well received for people that are trying to um, do some of this really super computing type applications, and and maybe that's for people doing stuff at the hype, at hyperscale level um, or enterprise level. But um, you know, rack densities are going up, and they're going to keep going up, and we want to be prepared. 
Okay. Well, that's cool. So we've we've talked a lot about uh, batteries, PDUs, anything else in the data center you want to hit while I've got you here? Yeah, I think the other things you'd probably say are, um, you know, I think we covered the NMC. Um, maybe the other thing for the Rack PDU is um, we're going to launch, you know, gigabit uh, network capability that should be yeah. launched here in Q1. So if you're you know, tying that to a network and you don't want to sit there and manually uh, change the uh, the settings of the network and, and derate it to work with a 100 base T uh, uh, network card, then then you can you can just pop one off the shelf or you can uh, upgrade your existing Eaton line in the field to work with 100 gig. Um, so that would be a web card that's coming out that's reverse compatible both the new products and our legacy products here in nice. Q1. Nice. Yep. Another networking innovation. Well, that's cool. I, I uh, would be remiss if I didn't ask, too, because we've got a lot of uh, people that follow our content and tune in that are uh, work in IT, but they're big home labbers. So they've got their own archives for photos and videos mm -hmm. set up and racks and stuff that they play with at home uh, and, and hope to, to learn there and take that knowledge to work and, and be productive or their students and their learning. I mean, there's a lot of people messing around with tech at home, maybe more now than ever with uh, with you know, more people being home than ever, right? Yeah. Yes. So with with more people at home uh, building out infrastructures, whether it's traditional, you know, enterprise ZIT, or if it's just a lot of stuff like your routers and your your Wi-Fi and some sort of home server or a NAS or like this kind of stuff, what do you what do you have? Do you what do you tell hope people that are at the smaller scale? You know, what what's a good practice to protect your home or your home lab when it comes to to power? You know, it, I think a lot of people that, that want to go that, that route, I think some of the, the same principles apply. I do recommend a network card. Um, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're listening to this, the, this, this podcast up until this point, you're clearly interested and you want, <laughs> you want some level of control. You have yeah. it. You, you, your, 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 your wife or your significant other uh, may say you have a problem, but I, I can relate. But <laughs> we you know, are like, okay. <laughs> I, you know, you're you're probably in control. And that network card just allows you to do things like, um, you know, re remotely initiate a shutdown. You know, you can do that through the through the graceful shutdown agents that you're already set up. But you can do that, you know, by logging in. So, you say, hey, oh, I have a power alert. Okay, now I can initiate something, and I don't have to rush back into the closet. Um, and the other thing that I think that Kevin was showing you, you know, on the last video about the 9px, you have load segments on a lot of our units that are that are in affordable reach of your your audience. Mm -hmm. um, all the way down to the 5P, uh, whether that's a tower or a, um, a rack tower, we have multiple versions of the 5P. Um, you go to eaton.com slash 5P and kind of browse the, the, the portfolio. You, you can have a, you know, an outlet segment where you can put different devices on that certain segment, and you can just toggle that segment remotely over the network card. I think that's the kind of thing that um, gives you a lot more control and a lot more peace of mind if you're running a home lab, it's just that ability of control and full access. This is mine. I can do what I want when I want, mm -hmm. and I don't have to be there. So, yep. yeah, no, I mean, I've got a unit in my basement, and last man standing is the router and Wi Fi. Like, I don't care. My constituents in, <laughs> in my household have a lot of battery powered devices, laptops, phones, tablets, all that sort of thing. And while yep. they may lose gaming consoles, that's a different problem. And actually, um, you know, you can get some little units for under the desk if you're really serious about uh, about that too. But you know, in all practicality, most power outages in the U.S. anyway, residential, aren't that long. But if you can sustain and keep your your Wi-Fi active during that time, that's certainly super handy for being able to track. You know, whether it's Duke Energy site to see where your outage is, or the weather, or whatever else is going on, because in that case, not the the cell networks aren't always that reliable either. So. Preach on, yes. I mean, we, we, I, I have fiber to our home, and and uh, if I get a bleep, I'm, I'm I, you know, just a just a 15 second, 30 second outage. You know, you have to wait for everything to reboot, and uh, I can't take it. I, I don't. I just I go OCD. I lose well, it. Well, yeah. Well, and don't even start with people's crypto mines, right? Because <laughs> if, if those things lose the internet, they're toast, or if they reboot. Oh. I mean, some uh, of those things are so janky. Who the hell knows if it's going to come back without having to jiggle the uh, GPUs or whatever to, to get right. it to boot yeah. the right way? Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 
All right, well, this has been really cool. I know that you'll be sending us the new PDUs uh, with universal uh, connectors very, very soon. Uh, Kevin will be doing flips for that. And we'll... Uh, we'll Can you get them in pink? Can you, you make sure you order them in pink? Or I don't know if you guys have a favorite color, but make sure you, make sure you ping Jeff and get him to do something good. We'll, uh, we're getting some custom bezels made for some of our servers. Maybe we'll have okay. to get a, a, a storage view blue on... Uh, uh, on the PDUs, but uh, yeah, I don't care. Pink is fine. <laughs> we'll we'll get those and have another conversation about power. But uh, for now, this is great. I mean, the insights that you guys have, you touch so much of the world uh, in terms of big to small and 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 hyperscale too. Uh, you know, this is a great conversation just to learn a little bit more about what you guys are doing, how you're thinking about the world, and and what's coming next. I appreciate you you joining in. Now, thanks for having us, and uh, always a pleasure, Brian. Thank you. That's it.